I'm Dr. Jonathan Mendelson, a Pulmonary and Critical Care Fellow at New York University and the Simulation Fellow at the Department of Veterans Affairs, New York campus. I'm joined with my colleagues today, Dr. Beshoy Zachary, one of our ECMO intensivists, Bridget Toy, ECMO coordinator, Dr. Lily Cam, anesthesia resident, and Dr. Brian Kaufman, anesthesia and critical care attending. And we are part of the New York University ECMO education team. Today, we will feature two different uh, scenarios that, sh that uh, display different ECMO emergencies. Initially, we will show a simulation, followed by a didactic, followed by the solution to the case using simulation. This is part of the way that we prepare for ECMO emergencies here at New York University. Hi, doctor. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm really worried about this patient. I'm Lily. I'm the ECMO nurse for Mr. Jones here. I'm Dr. Mendelson. I'm uh, one of the ECMO fellows. Thanks for calling me over. What's uh, going on? Sure. So we have Mr. Jones. He's 42. Okay. He came in with influenza. He's been with us for about six days. Okay. Developed hypoxemic respiratory failure. He needed to be intubated. Mm -hmm. um, it got progressively worse, progressive hypoxemic respiratory failure. So he got started on VV ECMO okay. uh, with an Avalon catheter. Okay. Oh, yes. through the right IJIC. Yes. Okay. So like I said, uh, it's day six. He got a chest x-ray this morning and since then has been progressively hypoxemic. Okay. I'm not sure what to do. Okay, and the, the x-ray was just an hour ago, and yes. since then he dropped his sets. Okay, 81%, that's pretty low. He was 89% earlier. I see. Earlier. And tell me, um, the ECMO circuit, any changes to the circuit today? No changes to the circuit. He has a flow of 3 liters per minute, and okay. sweep is also 3 liters per minute. Nothing okay. has changed. Um, the second thing is, any change to the ventilator at all? Uh, the vent settings have been stable. Exactly the same? Yes. Okay, I see. All right, um, so let's, for starters, maybe let's go up on the um, flow on the ECMO circuit from three liters to four liters and see if we can get any mileage out of that. Okay, All right. so I'm gonna increase the flow from three liters to four liters. Okay, sounds good. So let's see if there's any improvement in the oxygen saturation. Seems to be actually worse. Um, do me a favor, just go back to the previous settings. Let me call um, the intensivist, uh, the ECMO intensivist, and we'll, we'll get to this right away. Okay, so I'm going to return him to three Please. Years. Yeah, Dr. Zachary, um, do you mind uh, coming down and helping us out with an ECMO uh, situation? Yeah, patient's fairly hypoxemic, um, high 70s, uh, low 80s. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right, bye. Given that this patient became hypoxemic after patient movement, and given that he also became worse in spite of increasing the pump flow, my concern is that this patient has recirculation. Recirculation is when infused oxygenated blood is drawn back into the circuit without passing systemically. As you can see here in this graphic, the blood that is returned to the patient is supposed to go into the right ventricle and then the pulmonary circulation. However, when a proportion of that blood gets sucked back into the access cannula, this is wasted flow, and we define it as recirculation. There are three factors which affect the rate of recirculation. First is pump RPM. As the pump RPM is increased, there's a higher chance of recirculation. Second is cannula position. If the cannulas are close together, there is a higher risk of recirculation. And the third is native cardiac output. If the patient's native cardiac output increases, there is a lower risk of recirculation. So how you would diagnose recirculation is that the patient will be hypoxic. The first thing you want to do when walking into a room to assess the ECMO circuit is looking at the access and return line. You should always see a color difference between the two lines. However, in recirculation, they will appear the same color. This will prompt you to draw three blood gases, including the pre-oxygenator blood gas, the post-oxygenator blood gas, and the patient's arterial blood gas. With these gases, you will notice that the pre-oxygenator PO2 will be approaching the post-oxygenator PO2. It will also be greater than the patient's PO2 on their blood gas. Next, we will look for a transthoracic echo. With the Avalon cannula, we're looking for a return jet directed across the tricuspid valve. So these are two pictures of the Avalon cannula. 
On the left, you notice a good color difference between the access and return line. However, in the picture on the right, you notice that the lines are the same color. This is a sign of recirculation. So in summary, recirculation is typically a problem of pump RPM or cannula positioning. To make the diagnosis, blood gases are required, and typically the pre-oxygenator PO2 is higher than the patient PO2. For treatment, one can try reducing the pump RPM. However, cannula repositioning is typically required. So in this particular patient, I would first send the three blood gases, pre-oxygenator, post-oxygenator, and patient. And if they are suggestive of recirculation, I would do an echo to assess cannula position. If needed, the cannula can then be repositioned. Okay, um, Lily, what I think we should do is I think you should send the three blood gases, pre-oxygenator, post-oxygenator, and patient, and please let me know as soon as those come back. Okay, let me get those gases for you right now. Okay. Okay, so they're, both, they're all sent off now. Okay, perfect. Let's see. It looks like the pre-oxygenator PaO2 is quite a bit higher than the patient's um, PaO2 on the right radial A line. Um, this is very, very suggestive of recirculation. Okay. The, the next thing that I think we should do is take a quick focus look with the ultrasound to see if the um, cannula is positioned okay. So um, I'm going to perform a quick subcostal echo to see um, if the cannula is well placed. Okay. It looks like um, there might be a jet going into the hepatic vein. I think this cannula might be malpositioned. So what I'm going to do is pull back on the Avalon catheter about two centimeters and reassess with, with ultrasound. Now that I've pulled back on the Avalon catheter, I'm going to reassess. And it looks like the return jet is directed across the tricuspid valve. The cannula uh, now looks like it's in good position. Hi, doctor. Thanks again for coming. Um, I'm Lily. I'm the ECMO nurse for Mr. Smith. Um, you know, I've just been kind of worried about him. Dr. Mendelson, the uh, ECMO fellow, um, certainly happy to come by and see him. What's, what's going on? So Mr. Smith, he's 42, he came in with influenza, he developed hypoxemic respiratory failure, needed to be intubated, um, got worse, so we started him on EV ECMO via the Avalon cannula. Okay. Um, it's now day six, he's starting to develop a new sepsis, he's been Same. requiring pressors, he's still hypoxemic, Okay. Um, and I've also noticed that this lines have been moving a lot, do you think that's a problem? Um, you know, I probably wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, sometimes that just happens. Um, let me just take a quick glance at his labs. It looks like the white count is up to 22,000 today, so it probably is sepsis that's making him worse. Um, maybe he just needs more support on the uh, VV um, ECMO. So why don't we take the, um, the blood flow rate from three liters to four liters and see if that helps uh, if that helps us at all. Okay, I'm all gonna right. change the flow from three liters to four liters. Okay, perfect, let's see what happens. Changing the flow, okay. it's now four liters. Huh. Okay, so, hmm. seems to be going in the wrong direction. Um, Lily, can you do me a favor and actually um, just reverse that change? Yes. Um, in the meanwhile, I'm going to place a call to the um, ECMO intensivist and we'll try to figure this out at ASAP. Sure. Going back down to three meters. All right, perfect. Yeah, yeah we're going to need some help down here. Thanks. Given that this patient became hypoxemic in the setting of developing septic shock and relative hypovolemia, and given the movement of the access line, I would be concerned about access insufficiency. Access insufficiency occurs when the vein or the right atrium collapses around the access cannula. The access cannula is under negative pressure, and as you can see here, sometimes the vena cava or the right atrium can collapse around it. This leads to intermittent drops in flow and progressive hypoxemia. There are various etiologies of access insufficiency. The most common is internal compression and typically this is due to hypovolemia. 
However, it is prudent to run through the circuit and make sure there is no kinking or clotting in the access line. There are other processes which need to be considered with access insufficiency, and these are, fall under external compression, the most common being tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, or patient agitation with Valsalva. The diagnosis of access insufficiency can be seen with movement, also known as chattering or kicking of the access line. You will notice intermittent drops in the ECMO blood flow associated with patient hypoxemia. The therapy for access insufficiency is to first decrease the ECMO blood flow along with giving volume resuscitation. If this does not help with the access insufficiency, you should complete a full ECMO circuit check along with obtaining a chest x-ray and TTE to rule out any compressive processes. If access insufficiency persists despite a volume resuscitation, you can place a second access cannula. In summary, access insufficiency is defined by excessively negative access pressures with associated collapse of the vena cava or right atrium around the access line. This will typically be associated with intermittent movement of the access line. Therapy involves adequate volume resuscitation and consideration of compressive processes. In this patient who has developed new septic shock with relative hypovolemia, I would reduce the pump RPM while administering adequate volume resuscitation. If access insufficiency persists, I would consider compressive processes by doing a circuit check and ruling out tension pneumothorax and cardiac tamponade. So, Lily, it turns out that when you mentioned before that the line was moving, that was probably very significant. Um, so I'm actually concerned that this could be access insufficiency. Um, what I think we should do right now is to come down on the ECMO um, blood um, flow from 4 liters per minute to 2.5 liters per minute. Okay. And um, while you're doing that, if you could pull this a liter of crystalloid as well, sure. um, that would be really helpful. So I'm going down on the blood flows from 4 to 2.5 liters per Perfect. minute. Perfect and I'm hanging a one liter bolus. Okay, excellent. And do you mind just double checking that there's nothing wrong with the ECMO circuit itself? I'm running the circuit, okay. and I don't see any kinks or any other problems with the circuit. Okay, and af after the liter um, completed, did you notice any improvement in oxygen saturation? It looked like there was a very slight improvement, um, but the okay. lines are moving again. I see. Okay, at this point, um, I think we should rule out some of the compressive um, etiologies that would cause um, access insufficiency. So what I'm going to do is um, a quick um, ultrasound uh, for lung sliding um, as well as a focused echocardiogram to rule out uh, tamponade. All right. All right, so what we're going to do is a quick uh, bedside ultrasound to check for adequate lung sliding, um, which in this patient will exclude pneumothorax underneath the probe. So the most likely place for that to occur is going to be in the bilateral apex. So on the right apex, I see the lung sliding. Okay. And on the left apex, I see the lung sliding. So um, that essentially in this patient um, will uh, exclude tension pneumothorax as a cause. Um, so now we're going to move on to a focused echo in this patient. Okay. She's in here. So I'm looking for pericardial fluid, and I don't see any pericardial effusion, which makes the diagnosis of pericardial tamponade um, extremely unlikely. So I think we can move on from those two causes. So it looks kind of like the chest x-ray is similar to this morning, um, so no, no real significant difference there. Um, what I think we should do is, um, is just hang a, a second liter of crystalloid. It's running. Okay, perfect. So um, uh, looks like the um, oxygen saturation is, is starting to pick up a little bit. So that's great. Um, I think that if this patient didn't respond to fluid resuscitation, um, this would be a patient that we should strongly consider placing a second access line. But it seems like this patient um, is actually improving already, so that's good. Great. All right. Thanks for your help, Dr. Of course. Thank you. So that concludes our two ECMO uh, emergency cases. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, watching them with us. Uh, this is just a snapshot of how we at NYU uh, train for these possible ECMO emergencies.